Okay, this is the recorded lecture for the chapter two in the history and systems of psychology. We're going to start uh, this particular section by going way, way back to the ancient Greeks. So previously in chapter one, we did what I like to call a primer of the relevant philosoph philosophical topics and philosophy of mind. And so we kind of did an overview of things like metaphysical questions, including monism versus dualism, and epistemological questions like rationalism versus empiricism, and also free will versus determinism, and realism versus nominalism, so various debates. And in chapter one being just kind of an intro and overview, we're going to revisit each one of those questions uh, in detail in the coming chapters. In chapter two we're going to touch on kind of all of those, but we're mostly going to be focusing on the questions related to both mind-body or monism-dualism questions and also rationalism and empiricism questions. In the rest of the first unit, chapters three, four, and five, we'll also be talking about um, all of the other questions as well. So let's start first with this guy Parmenides and his uh, metaphysics. Remember, a metaphysics is a philosophy that deals with uh, what reality, right? So physics is the study of, is the scientific and observational study of reality, but metaphysics is more of the philosophical questioning of what is real. And for Parmenides, he is infamous for writing these uh, very uh, almost uh, elliptical, impossible to understand kind of statements like nothing comes from nothing. Being is always being. If it is, it is. If it is not, it never was nor will be. And philosophers, of course, have struggled for a long time to make a lot of sense out of this stuff. But what's what we can kind of take from, from this is that he's trying to claim, trying to argue that being is eternal. That is, anything that exists must have always existed. It has no beginning and it has no end. And here he's using words like something and nothing because the idea is that if if something exists, it is a something. If it doesn't exist, then it's a nothing. And as he claims, nothing comes from nothing. So if something does not exist, it's a nothing. You cannot turn that nothing into a something. So. He's basically just saying here that change essentially is impossible. Things cannot come into existence or they cannot go out of existence. They must exist and they must be eternal. So if it is, it is, is his argument. And he also adds to that another difficult statement here, nor was it once nor will it be since it is now altogether one continuous. So this idea of continuity, continu being continuous. And so his argument here is that the universe is really just one thing. Of course, that's that differs from our experience. We see uh, a multiplicity of things, right? We see lots of different things in the world around us, but Parmenides is saying, no, the true nature of reality is really just the one. With a capital O there, he thinks that this is sort of, you know, the kind of the the truth of reality is that it's all just one continuous, in fact he sees it as a sphere. He says the universe is really a perfect sphere, the one, and it, it uh, is eternal from the, from the previous point. That next little subline there is not Parmenides, but uh, it's from the Beatles, but it captures the same basic idea. Um, and so what we would, you know, immediately start to question here is, is why does Parmenides believe this? If, 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 our, if we look out on the world, we observe the world, and we see things changing, we see things come into existence and go out of existence, we see many things instead of just the one perfect sphere, uh, how do we reconcile that, um, that, that, the, that his view of the universe is actually more accurate than our observation? And so Parmenides basically just says that that's all an illusion. Change is an illusion. Perception is an illusion. And so now what we're seeing here is that we're seeing that his particular metaphysical view that suggests that reality is not as it appears has some implications for where human knowledge comes from. And so now we're going to talk about knowledge questions and we're going to see him there that he's a rationalist, right? His argument is that we cannot uh, attain 
uh, true knowledge about reality through our senses. The only way we can do it is from in inner knowledge. And so his, his argument is that it's through our capacity for reason and logic that we are able to discover these truths. And that logic, logical thinking, is our special ability that we have to, to really uh, discover the truth of the universe. Parmenides is also assuming here that, that the universe must in fact be a logical, perfect place. And so then the, the language of logic is the language of the universe. And so this idea that the way it appears is not the way it really is because the senses are seen as illogical, whereas our rational mind is logical. So we should ignore the senses. We should just discard ideas that come from the senses and replace them with ideas that come from our own inner rational minds. Um, and so one of his students, Zeno, has a variety of paradoxes designed to help us, you know, un understand why he would think that, that set the, the perceptual systems are uh, an illusion, since it, senses are an illusion. Um, now, so in the book we mention the uh, Achilles versus the, the tortoise in a race, uh, but, but there's another one that's a little bit easier to, to explain, the uh, dichotomy paradox. So imagine that you're running a race, it's 100 meters, and before you could get to the finish line, you would of course have to hit the halfway mark of 50 meters, and before you could even get to that point, you would have to hit the halfway to that, which is 25 meters. Before you could even get to 25 meters, you'd have to get halfway there, which is 12 and a half. And before you could get to 12 and a half, you'd have to get halfway there, which is 6.25. And, and then beyond that, it's 3.125 is half of that, and so on and so forth. So the idea here is that we can keep subdividing these distances in half. And we don't ever have to stop, right? The way the mathematics works and the number system works is that we can subdivide any quantity in half. Um, and the numbers just get smaller and smaller and smaller, but they never go to zero. We, we, know, we never have to stop. And so the idea is that we could almost you know, imagine that we are able to somehow fit or squeeze infinity within this finite distance of 100 meters. How can you have a finite distance, 100 meters, with a start line and a finish line, but have an infinity of subdivisions between them? That's Zeno's claim of, of, of a paradox. Now, in modern mathematics, there are challenges to, to solve this issue, but what we should realize is that from the perspective of Zeno, his claim is, is that we have to pick which of these two things makes the most sense. Is it mathematics, or is it our perception of a world where things exist at distances from, from each other? And Zeno, following what Parmenides would say, is that mathematics is logical, and therefore we should go with what it tells us is true, and ignore the senses. If, if mathematics contradicts the senses, then that means the senses cannot be trusted. And that's a common theme with a lot of Greek rationalist philosophy, is just that the senses can't be trusted. Note also that on this point about Parmenides, that he talks about this separation of appearance and reality. And the crucial point there is that any time you hear any philosopher say that the, the, that appearance is not reality, that the way things look is not the same as how they really are, they're being a dualist first, right? Because they're suggesting that what's going on inside the mind, which is the world of appearance, is separated from what's going on in reality, which is outside the mind. But they're also probably going to then be a rationalist, right? Because if you if you say appearance is not reality, that means you don't trust the senses, and so you would have to have some alternative way of knowing what's going on in the world, and that alternative tends to be the inner knowledge, reason, and logic. And then we get here at the bottom Pythagoras, who you have encountered before in your geometry and trigonometry classes, right? You know the Pythagorean theorem for calculating the hypotenuse, length, length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle, but he was, he did, he did more than that. He was studying this kind of stuff, mathematics and geometry, because like Parmenides, he believes that the universe must be a perfect and logical place, and that you can't use observation, so, you know, a rejection of 
of science, really, which really didn't exist as a field back then, but anything based on observation would not be a valid way to to discover the truth of reality. You have to you have to study mathematics. You have to study patterns of numbers and geometric patterns and the principles of geometry. It's all logical. It's all uh, rational. Recall in your geometry homework in, in high school that you had to do a lot of proofs, right? And those are essentially exercises in deductive logic. So for Pythagoras, this idea is that by doing these kinds of things, you're actually uncovering the hidden secrets of the universe through all of this, this mathematical stuff. So he believes that we have the capacity for pure reason that can be separated from the imperfect uh, sensory ex ideas that we have. And now there's this other question, which goes back to chapter one, this, the, the question between realism and nominalism, right? Realism is the idea that the ideas in our mind correspond to things that are real, as opposed to just being ideas in the mind, which is nominalism. And what, we, what I think we can see from Parmenides and Pythagoras both is that they must be realists, because they are arguing that it's through this rational process that we're actually discovering the true reality. And so Parmenides has another one of his uh, uh, confusing quotes to, to capture that same kind of thought here. He says, thinking and the thought that it is are the same, for you will not find thought apart from what is. So that's a good statement right there. You will not find thought apart from what is. So what is is what exists, what's real. And you can't have thoughts that are somehow different from that. And later down there, he says, for thought and being are the same. It is necessary to speak and to think what is. For being is, but nothing is not. So his argument is that we can't really think of nothing. We're always thinking of something. And that, of course, must be something that, that is. And so something we want to add to this now is that we saw that, that uh, Parmenides and Pythagoras were both rationalists because they don't trust the senses. Um, but the idea here is that if you don't trust the senses, you have two choices. One is that you could say, well, I don't trust the senses, but the senses are the only source of information I have. But that takes us into the domain of what we call skepticism. If, if the senses are the only source of knowledge we have and they're not trustworthy, then we guess we don't really know anything about the world, right? And so we would remain skeptical of human knowledge that it could correspond to anything real at all. So it could perhaps all be an illusion. But uh, people don't want to uh, believe such a thing, most people anyway, so instead, and certainly Parmenides and Pythagoras did not want to go that way, so they want to be realists. They, they say that, that our knowledge does correspond to what is real. And so we need an alternative. If the senses can't tell us what's real, we need to have the innate knowledge and the reason and logic that we are capable of. So what we're seeing here is that realism and rationalism are going to, to tend to uh, go hand in hand, right? They don't mean the same thing. Realism means that our ideas correspond to reality. Rationalism means that those ideas come from within us, from innate, innate knowledge and logic. But they tend, it, it tends to be the case that, especially amongst the Greeks, the, the, the Greeks who are rationalists also tend to be realists. There is this issue here of a circle that I want to mention. So the idea is, uh, usually in, in when I do this in a regular class, I ask everyone to raise their hand if they've ever seen a circle. Uh, and everyone does, of course, but then I tell them that they are wrong because in uh, reality, what we have seen are not actually circles because circles have a very specific definition in geometry, right? They have to have a a perfectly constant radius, all 360 degrees around. And they have to have, uh, what follows from that then deductively is they have to have an area of pi r squared and various other qualities such as that. And we've never seen one of those. We've never seen a truly perfect circle that really had a constant radius and an area of pi r squared. Every circle that we can see has an imperfection of some sort. And so the question here becomes twofold. One is, how did we ever have such an idea of a circle? Where did, our, where did this knowledge come from? If I've never seen one, how do I know about these things? And the rationalists would argue that, well, it's, it's because you were either born with that knowledge or you're able to reason to that knowledge. You're able to, to use logic 
to arrive at the concept. And then, of course, being a realist, we would ask the next question, which is, do perfect circles actually exist? Is, the, is there something out there uh, beyond the imperfect circles of our experience that represents that kind of perfection? And as realists, Parmenides and Pythagoras would say, yes, they, they must be real. So again, of course, that's Pythagor Pythagoras' idea of trying to get at the true nature of reality through reason, right? Um, so he would say that, you know, perfection exists. The universe is perfect, and so is logic. And there are other things here listed at the bottom, things like infinity, right? So again, you've never seen infinity exactly, right? You can't, inf you can't fit infinity inside the eyeball, but nevertheless, we have some idea of this concept. So where did the idea come from? And we have reasoned to it, is the claim here. Now I mentioned earlier that both Pythagoras and Parmenides were dualist because of this uh, separation of appearance from reality. Um, and so I want to point out here another parallel that, so that the rationalists, not only do they tend to be uh, to uh, realist, but they're also dualists, right? So dualism tends to lead to rationalism because of this idea that if what's happening inside the mind is somehow removed from the outside world, we need some sort of uh, means to know that world. And again, the senses don't work. The senses are not a channel to get us in touch with that world. So we need uh, uh, the, the innate knowledge and we need logic. Parmenides believed that the innate knowledge was divinely endowed. He, he, as a follower of Greek religions, he believed that the gods had implanted knowledge into us when we were born so that we would, and of course, our are given, given, given us our capacity for, for reason and logic. So what we have here ultimately is a general theme of rejecting sensory knowledge. Parmenides, as I mentioned, believes that knowledge is implanted by the gods and that perception is therefore illogical and irrelevant. We don't need it. Another one of Zeno's paradoxes that's also designed to show why we won't, don't want to trust the senses is, is the millet seed example. So what happens here? Millet is a is a grain like like wheat. So you imagine, for example, that he might be standing next to a basket full of of millet in the marketplace, and he drops a single seed onto the ground, and he asks whoever is standing there with him, "Did you hear anything?" The answer is no. You heard nothing. The single grain makes no sound. But if he picks up now, and imagine he picks up this whole basket full of, of millet, and he dumps it all on the ground, and you can definitely hear that. And so Zeno says, look, here is another uh, example of how illogical perception is, because a single grain makes z no sound. But many grains make sound. And the idea is that if, if, if a single grain makes no sound, we could quantify that with a zero. And so... 10,000 grains all falling at the same time should still be 10,000 times zero, which would make zero sound. And so Zeno says this is clearly a problem, that we cannot trust the senses. Now, we have knowledge that Zeno did not to help us understand perhaps what's really going on here. Zeno did not realize that there was such a thing as a sensory threshold. Right, and that there could be sounds that exist that we do not hear uh, because they are not loud enough. So single seed does not make zero sound. Zero, the single seed might make 0 0.01 sound. And then, of course, if you multiply that times 10,000, you get a bigger number and you now can hear it. But but the point here is that even if Zeno was wrong, um, we, we get a sense of his, his motivation and his thinking here that, that we're trying to show that the senses don't work. But it's important to now realize that these ideas of dualism and um, rationalism stem from these ideas that the universe is not quite the way it seems, right? So with Parmenides claiming that the universe is an eternal, unchanging sphere, um, certainly we have to find a way to reconcile that, that fact with our sensory experience, and he does that by rejecting the senses. But we don't have to agree with Parmenides that the universe is really an eternal, unchanging, perfect sphere. There are other metaphysical ideas. And so here we get Heraclitus. He claims you can never step into the same river twice. What does that mean? Well, he means that if you 
walk across. Imagine you're wading across a shallow river or stream. You turn around and you walk back across it. He's, his claim is that that was not the same river. And and the, the idea, of course, is that it's always changing. The, the, the pattern of the currents and the flows, uh, even at the bank, it's gradually eroding, even just by grain of sand, one at a time, it's still changing at some microscopic level. So it's never the same. And it can never go back to a previous state that it was in. So here he's using this as a metaphor for the for all of the universe that that everything is always changing and will never return to a previous state. So here instead of saying that being you know eternal being is the essence of reality that Parmenides said Heraclitus says change is the true essence of reality. The universe is always changing. So now you might think well Oh, I see the world change. I can see change. I can I can observe it. So therefore, does this mean I might be able to trust my senses? And for Heraclitus, the answer is, yeah, maybe. I'll explain the maybe here in a little bit, but the idea is essentially that, that uh, this opens up the door that we could possibly trust our senses, and therefore we don't have to be a rationalist, right? And then we also get Democritus, who has a similar idea that the world is changing, but he has a more specific and concrete example of of how that works. So he's the one of the main uh, characters here who gives us our ideas of atoms. Now, his view of atoms is completely different than the way we think of atoms in modern physics that are composed of all these other subparticles. An atom, in Democritus's view, is the fundamental unit of matter. It is indivisible. And so these small little atoms, which we might think of them as tiny little marbles, right, just little balls that come in different kinds. So there, there, there would be, he doesn't understand, of course, the periodic table. So he's not talking about hydrogen atoms and oxygen and carbon. He's talking about things like there could be fire atoms and water atoms and stone atoms and wood and flesh atoms, right? And so all these different kinds of atoms, uh, they're different from each other that defines the different kind of material substance th that they make up, but they still are basically atoms. They're all fundamentally the same. And they can move around just like little marbles can roll around. These things are flying around, colliding with each other. And so we end up with all these atoms always moving, right? And, 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 and so here we can imagine that this is similar to Heraclitus to say that the universe is always changing because if you imagine a universe made of of countless atoms that are always bouncing around off of each other that the universe will never return to a particular state it's always going to be different as those atoms are always uh, ricocheting off of each other and for Democritus here uh, one of the things that we need to realize here is that in addition to all those kinds of atoms that I just listed the um, stone atoms and fire atoms and water atoms, there would also be mind atoms. And that's pretty crucial because now this means that we, we don't have to separate mind from reality. The mind is made of atoms which are just atoms like all the other atoms. So this means that the mind could perhaps actually find a way to interact with reality. And that would be through perhaps some kind of a, a, a transmission between the, uh, the two. And that gives us then the possibility of knowledge coming from the senses. So that would be empiricism. And it's kind of interesting here that from, from Democritus, who is going to argue from the empiricist perspective, he gives us what might perhaps be our first ever psychological theory. And it's a theory of perception, right? Because, of course, the implication, if you're going to claim that knowledge comes from the senses, you might need to start explaining how the senses actually work. The rationalists don't care. And they're not going to bother coming, giving us a, a psychological theory of how sensation and perception works. But the the, the burden would be on the on the empiricist if they're going to if they're going to claim that we 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 obtain knowledge through the senses and learn, then we need theories of how perception works, and we need theories of how learning works. And we're definitely going to see as we move through all of these chapters that most of these uh, theories of, of of perception and learning, which represent sort of the very fundamental parts of psychology are coming from empiricist philosophers. And so here is our first one. Democritus has a theory of perception called the emanation theory. He starts by suggesting that we have objects in the world. Again, they're made of atoms, but they also emanate uh, or emit images or copies, little tiny copies of themselves. And these are called idola. That's plural, the eidolon singular. And there's also an empty space between the atoms called the ether. So the idola fly through the ether. 
eventually they will come into contact with other atoms, especially in including uh, mind atoms. And so the argument here is that objects are emitting idola. Eventually the idola come into contact with mind atoms through our sensory organs. And there what happens is that these idola trigger the motion, motion of mind atoms. And here the claim is that when the mind atoms move, that's when perception occurs. But of course, that's also when we have consciousness. Consciousness is itself the motion of mind atoms. And so this is a very strong argument for empiricism because what he's really saying here is that consciousness itself would not exist if the, if the mind atoms don't move. And the mind atoms only move when they are stimulated by the idola which means perception, right? So there is no mind without perception. There's no consciousness without external perceptual input. The mind cannot just exist independent of perception, which is exactly what the, the dualists and rationalists like Pythagoras were saying. So we also see then that Democritus is not a dualist. Right? He, is, he is putting the mind into the material world. So he's a monist, there's only one reality, and he's a materialist because that, that one reality is made of matter, solid material things, atoms. And so we've got all these mind atoms and all these sorts of things. Um, and now we see that there's a connection. We previously saw that the dualist became rationalists. So here we see that a, a monist, a materialist, becomes an empiricist because now we don't have to have that disconnect between mind and world. Everything's all just atoms. Now, just to make it confusing, though, uh, we're, we're going to have an exception to our rule. And so here we have Heraclitus, uh, Heraclitus who was a dualist. So his claim is that... Um, we can perhaps know the world through the senses, but nevertheless, there has to be a, a kind of some sort of an interpretation that happens. That, that, and so the, the, the analogy that I really like the most is the idea of a translator, right, or an interpreter. So imagine that you're speaking to someone who speaks another language, and they say something in their language, and of course, it's meaningless to you. You have no idea what it means. Um, so you don't know what they're saying. But what if you have a translator or an interpreter? That means that they're going to be able to hear the other person turn and tell you what they have said. And now we would ask the question, do you really know what the other person has, told, has said? And the answer is no. What you really know is what the translator told you. And so your knowledge is indirect, right? You don't have direct uh, the, the direct ability to understand what the other person's saying. It's only indirect through this uh, intermediary or third party. And then there are all kinds of questions such as, how do you know that the translator is telling you the truth? They might be lying. Or maybe they're just not a very good translator. Maybe they don't, one of the two languages that they speak, they're not very good at. So they don't quite understand what the other person says, or they don't quite phrase it in the way that's appropriate for your language. Or maybe if you've ever heard the phrase lost in translation, right, there might maybe some aspects of meaning that simply just cannot be translated properly. So how do we apply this to when we're talking about perception? Well, for Heraclitus being a dualist, it's almost like he's saying that the physical world and the mental world don't speak the same language and we need an interpreter. And so that's some kind of sensory process that converts the incoming uh, sensory in input or what we call sensations into a meaningful perception. And so that would be our intellect. Right? We have to use our intellect to do that. So Heraclitus here is going to make a claim that people will understand the world differently. People perceive the world differently. They make sense of things in slightly different ways because of our variations in our capacity for intellect, reason, and logic. That's what we have to use. So we see hints of rationalism here, right? His emphasis on intellect and reason. Uh, but still, knowledge is ultimately coming through the senses here. It's just an interpretation of the senses, as opposed to more of a direct interaction, the way Democritus does it. Now there's another ism that we have to get into here, one of our dozens and dozens of isms in this class. Note that when we were talking about Democritus and his atoms, that they move around, they collide with other atoms, and so we can essentially predict the motions of atoms. If I know the mass and velocity of one atom, and another atom that collides with it, then I can predict the way in which they will uh, 
uh, bounce off of each other. And, the, and I can predict their paths in space. And then, of course, the idea here would be that if I had the capacity to actually know the position and velocity and mass of every single atom in the universe, uh, that I could predict the future, right? That I would be able to map out the, the, uh, the future paths of all of those atoms. Of course, modern physics tells us we can't know such things, but the idea is basically that there really is a um, predicted, determined outcome, that everything is going to eventually follow these very predictable, simple, basically laws of physics, right? And that law of physics is based around cause and effect. And so atoms don't have free will. Atoms don't get to move of their own accord. They are simply determined by their prior causes, which would be their collisions with other atoms. Now what's really important here is that mind atoms are, are, are included here. They're not excluded from the principles of physics, right, of cause and effect. Mind atoms do not get to move on their own, all right, so they don't have free will. They only move when they are stimulated by the idola, and then we get perception from that. All right? So not only is this a strong claim of empiricism, as I said earlier, but it's also a claim for determinism. Determinism meaning that all of our thoughts, our consciousness, our mind itself, is determined by the idola, by external stimulation. And so we have no free will. Now, sometimes we think about this and we think, well, I don't like that. I don't like this idea that we have no free will and that all of our thoughts and feelings and decisions and actions have prior causes that are strictly determined. And this is one of the things that we don't talk about in psychology. And we have to ask the question, do we, can we have free will and st still have psychology be a, a true science? So let's think about something here. Let's, let's work with this little definition of science I have, that, that so, the real goals of science are to be able to predict and control. So what that means, of course, is that a scientist doing an experiment will have a prediction, right? They're going to have a hypothesis, which is stated as a prediction of what will happen if I do this. And so now, of course, they have to control the situation. They have to manipulate variables and control for things. And then, of course, they should hopefully be successful and correct in their predictions. And by doing this, we're establishing what, you know, these basic cause and effect, deterministic cause and effect principles and rules that govern the universe. And in psychology, that would be our same goal, that we want to be able to have a hypothesis that predicts human behavior. And then I want to be able to conduct a study where I control and manipulate variables and I bring human participants into the laboratory and I put them into this situation and essentially I could predict. And if I'm, if I'm successful in my prediction, we might then say that I was actually in control, that I was really controlling their behavior. And therefore they didn't have free will when they did what they did in my study. But one of the issues here, of course, so the implication is that that's the goal of psychology then, is essentially to find these laws of behavior and to gradually chip away at free will. But the thing is, is that in psychology we don't um, usually achieve that degree of success in our prediction. A physicist might be able to predict what happens when two objects collide with each other, for example, uh, with a high degree of precision. But psychologists are lucky if, if, we, if we can predict 40% uh, of our uh, human subject variance. So if we're only accounting for 40% of people's behavior, then we're, what, how do we uh, uh, talk about the other 60% that's unexplained? Do we say that perhaps it's free will? And so that maybe what we can do is we can't really control people's behavior, but we can influence it a little bit, but the rest is free will. Well, maybe. Um, but there's another perspective here, is that when a physicist does research and, and studies things like collisions of objects and studies things like the law of conservation of momentum, where the sum of the momentums of the two objects before and after they collide has to be the same, you don't actually see the scientist showing 100% perfect uh, prediction. There's always something called measurement error. The, the ability of a physicist, physicist to measure momentum has some small error associated with it. So what they're going to achieve is what we would think is close to about 99.999% of the variance, but not all of it because of measurement error. And now we have to ask the question in psychology, 
Is measurement error a serious issue for us? Is it even a much bigger issue? So that the reason we're only accounting for 40% of the of, of the variance in human behavior is not because of free will, but it might, because, might be because our measures are really bad. Psychology is a much younger science than physics, and perhaps it's a more difficult science because we're trying to study and measure things that are hard to measure, like memory and attention and various other forms of cognition. So we need better tests. Right? And we need to improve our measurement to, limp, to minimize measurement error. And then the idea is that, again, gradually we'll be able to start increasing our predictive power to get into that same domain as the physicists up to the 99.9 something. And so, again, perhaps the idea is that we're gradually chipping away at free will. And we never talk about these things when we talk about psychology and science and research methods, but it's kind of implicit there that we, that this may be the uh, ultimate uh, goal and side effect of doing this work. Now, I don't have an answer to this question. I cannot tell you whether we have free will or not. It remains uh, such a debate. It's not necessarily scientifically testable. And this idea that we don't, there are a lot of things we don't know. Um, comes up with the next guy here, Protagoras. So if we think for a second, you know, we just had Parmenides and Pythagoras giving, giving us a metaphysical theory uh, that says the universe is perfect and logical and constant. And then we had Heraclitus and Democritus saying the universe is always changing. It's always different. It's never the same. So we get two completely opposing ideas. And how can we settle the debate? How do we know who's right and who's wrong? And, and Protagoras is making the claim that we can never really do that, that there's always a way to show how somebody's wrong. He was good at proving people wrong, right? So he could prove that Parmenides was wrong, but then he could turn around and prove that Heraclitus was wrong. And so his claim is that these kinds of statements, these metaphysical statements, because they can always be proven wrong in some way, that... Um, they're pointless, right? There's, we, we really can't know. If there's some reality that exists beyond our perception, something out there somewhere that we can't directly experience, there's no way we can really know about it. So in a sense, then, there's no point in even talking about it or worrying about it, right? This, it's all speculative and, and, you know, just forget about it. So he's now going to be an empiricist, I think, because he's going to basically say that what you know is what you experience, right, which is coming from your senses. And that reality, perhaps, is subjective. So there's no higher truth out there. There's no higher reality out there, no perfection, no absolutes. It's just what you experience. Reality is what you experience. So he has this quote, man is the measure of all things, meaning we as individuals, as individual human beings, are the measure of our experience and therefore of the world as we know it. So this is meaning now uh, subjectivity of experience, right? So you know, you, you know the other phrase that also originates with this kind of thinking, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So we could say beauty is a higher truth, perhaps, right? That there may be a, some absolute perfection to that, that everything that we label as beautiful, such as a flower or a person or a song or a tree, they possess some higher reality and Protagoras says no it's just your own subjective uh, perception of what that means to you and the same is true not just of something like beauty but also of um, uh, other higher concepts like uh, truth and justice and stuff like that and Socrates doesn't like this right this idea of, of extreme subjectivity so Socrates is a pretty famous well-known guy here um, and he does not like the idea of subjectivity. He wants to believe that it is, in fact, possible for us to really understand uh, these higher truths, like truth, justice, beauty, and all these things, um, and that we can, we can arrive at some deep understanding of them because they are real. And so he's giving us um, uh, what I'm calling here an early kind of cognitive psychology because he's helping us understand how we organize and categorize our knowledge. And so he's making a distinction between things that we'll call particulars versus things that we'll call the general general or the generalities, right? Which is the same as the universals, right? The big picture. So the generals would be things like truth and beauty, justice, piety, these kinds of, of big abstract ideas. Particulars would be specific instances of them. And so we create groups, we create categories, right? What kinds of things are beautiful? That's the general beauty. 
Well, it could be a person, it could be a song, it could be a flower or a tree or um, a poem or a piece of art, a sculpture. So each one of those things is a particular. And so what Socrates says is that if we study those things, if we, if we, if we go around and we just observe all of the things that we might label as beautiful, and then we sit back after all of those many observations and we contemplate and reflect on these experiences. He says that we should be able to come to an understanding of the general idea of beauty. So here he's making the claim that it is a combination of, of perceptual input as well as reflection and, and that kind of inner knowledge that helps us understand these ideas. But he wants to believe that they're real, that this is really a, a, an absolute truth uh, to things. Uh, but we can see that this kind of hierarchical or, or categorical reasoning is something that is part of modern psychology because we create categories all the time, right? So when another question becomes, for example, what is it that makes a dog a dog? You have all kinds of dogs. Right? You've got Great Danes, Poodles, Chihuahuas, German Shepherds, Pugs, and so forth. They all look very different from each other. You know, if you put a Great Dane and a, and a Chihuahua side by side, you've got two animals that could hardly look more different from each other in many ways. But nevertheless, we understand that they're still part of the same thing. They're both dogs. Even though we might have some difficulty in actually putting our finger on exactly what that characteristic is, right? Because it can't be something like the fur coat, because not all dogs have a fur coat. Or, of course, other animals also have one. So there's their one single trait that only dogs exist, only only dogs possess, and all dogs possess, right? So it would be something like that, that it is, it is a, a defining characteristic if and only if all dogs have it. Um, and so, you know, a tail, four legs, a snout, none of that stuff works, right? because again, other animals have those traits, and not all dogs necessarily have those traits. So it's, it's very difficult, but nevertheless, the idea is that we're able to form these categories. And, and so most of our knowledge is organized in these categorical ways, right? We have particulars and then we have the generals above them to organize that experience. Again, the question though is where does that knowledge come from? Socrates says it comes through a combination of experience and reflection. But here we get Plato, who is a student of Socrates, and he really gives us probably the most elaborate and famous claim about the origin of, of human knowledge, especially of those generalities or universals. And as I'm saying here, he is the epitome of Greek rationalism. So as you might imagine, he's going to say that this knowledge is innate. We're born with it. That's really one of the crucial parts of rationalism. So he starts with the metaphysics, as some of our previous guys did. It's called the theory of forms. And here he's saying that there are two realms of existence. There is the physical realm, which is the realm that we live in right now and that we are experiencing with our senses, but everything in the imperfect realm is, sorry, in the physical realm is imperfect. So the circles, for example, that I mentioned earlier, they're all imperfect in some way. But what about the perfect circle? Does it exist somewhere? And he said, yeah, there's actually another realm of existence and he calls it the ethereal realm. And in the ethereal realm, that's perfect, and that's where all of the perfect things exist. So in the ethereal realm, there's actually a, a form, a pure form, or the perfect essence of circularity. And every imperfect circle that we see in the physical realm is just a manifestation of that form. It, but it's an imperfect manifestation. And so, of course, going back to the question of dogs, for example, the idea is that all the different kinds of dogs are different from each other because they're all individually imperfect manifestations of the pure essence of dogness in the ethereal realm. Everything here in the physical realm is an imperfect manifestation of some essence or form in the ethereal. And that includes us as well as human beings because his argument is that we are an imperfect manifestation of our perfect soul, which before we were born, resided in the ethereal realm. So when we are born, what happens is that we have to transmigrate our soul. And Plato actually coins the, the word psyche here to refer to our mind and soul as being the same thing and gives us ultimately the word psychology. Plato says that what, when we are born, our soul has to transmigrate from the ethereal realm to the physical realm. And this is kind of a traumatic process that causes us to forget 
all of the knowledge that we had obtained while in the ethereal realm. Because as our soul is in the ethereal realm, we can come into direct contact with all of the perfect forms and come to know them. But we forget it when we have to go into the physical realm. But forgetting doesn't mean gone forever. Forgetting just means I can't remember it right now. I need a reminder. I need to be reminded. And so here his theory of knowledge is here called the reminiscence theory because his, his claim is that even though we are born forgetting these things, the knowledge is still inside us the whole time. And then what happens is that I become reminded by encountering the imperfect manifestations. So I'm born knowing what a perfect circle is, even though I don't remember the perfect circle. But when I see an imperfect circle, it reminds me a little bit of something that I already know. And then I see another and another and another. And over time, after enough reminders, I will now be able to recall that knowledge. And so again, this is true of all of our knowledge ultimately, is that ultimately it's all just remembering what we already knew from before we were born. That process he calls anamnesis. Think of amnesia as like forgetting and an being the undoing of forgetting, which is remembering, right? So ultimately the knowledge is innate. Like many rationalists, and like Zeno's paradoxes, Plato gives us a, a story here, an example to uh, help us understand why we don't want to trust the senses. So like, like the other rationalist, Plato doesn't trust the senses. It's called the allegory of the cave. So here what we have to think about is you have to imagine a situation where you've got a few prisoners, let's imagine three prisoners, chained to a wall inside of a cave. And in fact, we also have to add to this the idea that these three prisoners were born into this cave, so they don't actually even know they're in a cave because they don't know there's any other reality outside of the place that they're in. It's all that they've ever known is just this, this cave, the wall that they're chained to and the wall that's in front of them. Now, the way it's all set up is that the, the, um, the entrance to the cave is behind the prisoners, so they have their backs to it. Light can shine into the cave from the entrance, and as people might be walking back and forth um, uh, in front of the cave, they're going to cast shadows on the cave wall in front of the prisoners. And over time, the prisoners will observe these moving shadows. They will notice that there are certain patterns that occur uh, over and over again, shapes that they see over and over again. So they might even be able to come up with names to describe those shapes. They might even invent an entire language to communicate amongst themselves uh, about all of those shapes. But of course, we would understand from our privileged perspective outside the cave that what they're seeing is not real. Shadows are distortions, right? They don't really, they're not perfect reflections of the thing. They're just a distorted, imperfect uh, reflection of reality. And so Plato then asks us to imagine one of the prisoners could perhaps escape his change and leave the cave. And he would initially be blinded and confused by discovering the reality outside the cave. Um, but over time, he would come to understand that what he was experiencing in that cave was really an illusion in a sense. It was, it was false. It was just a distortion of reality. That there's a much richer and more interesting reality outside the cave. And then, of course, if he tries to go back into the cave to explain to the other prisoners, uh, hey, you guys, this, this reality that you think that you're living in here is not real at all. It's, you're, you're actually a prisoner. You're in a cave. There's something else going on beyond all of this, outside of all of this. They're just going to think he's crazy, right? And, of course, that's mostly the plot of the first Matrix movie, but the idea is that um, Plato thinks that our minds and our physical bodies, we're like prisoners in the cave, right? We're only seeing a distorted, imperfect version of reality. There is something better outside of that, which is his ethereal realm. Next up, we have Aristotle. So Aristotle, so Plato, Plato was a student of Socrates. Aristotle was a student of Plato. He differs from, from his, his teacher. Aristotle is an empiricist instead of a rationalist. And Aristotle famously kind of was one of our first scientists. He, he gave us an early version of physics that was ultimately replaced by Newton. And one of the problems with Aristotle is that, so he, he understood the importance of observation, right? So that you would observe the world 
and then try to generate explanations of your observations. And, and that's what he did. And he came up with these theories to explain his observations. The problem was that his theories were a little naive. Uh, so they were wrong in many ways. But what he's, what's really crucial about this, though, is that that's a form of reasoning that Aristotle formalized and called it induction. And so it's reasoning from the particular to the general. You make an observation, you make multiple observations over time, and then from those observations you're going to arrive at a general statement. So what he's arguing here is that knowledge works this way, that knowledge begins with observation and that the generalities only occur after the fact. Right? We have to build up to them with enough observations. And if you've ever heard the term bottom-up processing, that's exactly where that comes from. Right? It comes from the idea that we just have to observe particular things and ultimately the higher categorical things, the generalities of the universals, follow from that. They are created or built up out of our experiences. But Plato and the other rationalists argue instead for deduction, right? which is the opposite. It's defined as reasoning from the general to the particular. So the idea here is that the particulars would never be understood if we weren't already born with knowledge of the generalities, right? And we have to have them. The generalities come first. They are a priori. We have to be born with them in order to be able to start recognizing and understanding the world around us. And so that distinction between deductive logic and inductive logic is really capturing then the difference between rationalism for deduction and empiricism for induction. And of course, if induction is bottom-up processing, deduction is top-down processing, right? You, you start with the, the general knowledge and the particulars can all be derived from that in a top-down way. But for Aristotle, he wants to use induction as a way of knowing, right? Which means observation. Right? And that's the beginning of, of science and observation. And, and so, of course, he's an empiricist for that same reason. Now, as I had just explained, the rationalists tend to like the deductive kinds of arguments, right? They say that you could never really come to know the universal just by observing particulars. You could never come to understand a perfect circle just by, just by observing imperfect circles. You have to be born with it. It has to be primary. So it has to be a priori, right? It has to come before. Therefore, it has to come before any experience. And of course, the only thing that can come before experience will be something you have to be born with. So it's innate. But the empiricists say, no, you can be born a blank slate. You can be born without any innate knowledge. And you start having observations. And so through these observations, you eventually arrive, you know, you abstract out from your observations the, the understanding of the universals or generalities. So in this case, the particulars are primary. They come first. And then one more time to, to, to think about here the problem of universals. These universals are generalities that we know about. Are they real or not? Are there perfect circles? Obviously, Plato says, yes, there are, right, in the ethereal realm. Um, and what we're going to see here is that, again, I mentioned this earlier in the notes, that the rationalists tend to be realists because, again, the claim here is that it is through the innate knowledge that we have that, that we can really know anything. That's the higher reality, the true reality. Whereas the empiricists are going to tend to be nominalist because what we're going to see here is that if, we say, if I say that the only, my, my understanding of perfect circles only comes from observing imperfect circles. And so it's really just a, it's a byproduct of my experiences. And it's the name I give to my experience. So the idea is that I've just experienced things in a very subjective way. I can come up with a name to describe that experience. And maybe I can try to share that knowledge with other people using language. But what we might claim is that that shared knowledge or social knowledge is what we call a social construct, right? It's just an idea that we have invented and given a name, but it's not necessarily real. So that might, could mean that, that there is no such thing as a perfect circle. There's only just a bunch of imperfect circles that we are lumping together into a category. And there's only, and there's no such thing as an essence of dogness. There's only just a bunch of different animals that we're lumping together in a category and we're going to call it dog. And there's a group of different animals, we're going to lump them together and call them cats, and so on and so forth. And that's nominalism, right? Nom means name. So these things exist in name only, as ideas. They're not real. And there we have it. That is the end of the chapter two notes.